As you have probably heard, Democratic legislators in this year's session are working to pass a wealth tax for Washington, which would levy a 1% tax on residents with assets above $250 million. The bill is considered necessary to implement this year's budget, so advocates are working to raise awareness and put pressure on legislators in advance of passing the annual budget. Carolyn Brotherton, Ph.D., is the Progressive Revenue Policy Associate at the Economic Opportunity Institute in Seattle, and she joins us now to talk about this. Carolyn, hello. How are you? Hello. I'm very good. Thank you. So, you know, I just gave kind of a cursory overview here, but specifically, what is a wealth tax and how would it work? Yeah. So a wealth tax is being proposed by um, state lawmakers in Washington this year is a new idea for the United States, but it's an idea that has um, been popular and successful in other countries and European countries for um, many years. The basic concept is um, to use a property tax, a 1% property tax, to tax the um, financial and tangible assets, things like stocks and bonds, of the very, very wealthy in our state. We're talking multimillionaires and billionaires. Right now, those assets are not taxed at all before they're sold during a person's lifetime. And if you're familiar with Washington's economy, with our with our national economy, if you're familiar with trends in wealth inequality, the financialization of our economy, you know that a lot of the new wealth that's being generated is going to the top fraction of a percent and it's being held in things like tech stocks and bonds. So wealth tax basically just says, you know, we're leaving a lot of resources on the table and let's tax assets that aren't taxed at all um, at a modest rate um, and, you know, bring billions of dollars into our state that we really need to fund all of these big things that we love and care about. Yeah, I want to ask you about that, but I, I will ask you first, you, you've mentioned the small number of people who would be impacted. How many state residents would be subject to this tax? Yeah, so the current legislation, as it's been introduced this session, would say it's a 1% property tax on financial assets where the first quarter billion or $250 million is exempt from taxation. And so at that level, that impacts around 700 taxpayers in Washington state which is pretty remarkable. We have around 100 billionaires in Washington, and then we have many thousands of folks who are lucky to have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of assets. It's pretty remarkable. It's a very small number. It's about 0.01% is my understanding, as you say, about 700 people, 100 billionaires in this state. And can we estimate how much a wealth tax would raise annually? Yeah, so the Department of Revenue built a model to estimate how much revenue this legislation would bring in and I can tell you more about the model if you want, um, but it would raise around $3.2 billion a year. $3.2 billion a year. And so, you know, in terms of the state budget, talk a little bit about the necessity for a wealth tax. Uh, and we can we can certainly talk about, and I, I want to talk about the regressive nature of Washington's uh, tax structure as it is, but where are some of the areas that were coming up short that a wealth tax would really help with? Yeah, so I think it's, impossible to talk about the inadequacy of our tax system without talking about its regressivity because they're tied together. Our state is reliant on the sales tax to raise most of its revenue, around 50%, give or take. The sales tax is providing declining revenue over time relative to the size of our economy, relative to the population growth. And so our reliance on the sales tax, which is a regressive tax, actually sets us, sets us up to have a structural deficit for revenue that's just getting worse and worse over time. So our state tax code doesn't raise enough revenue to do big things. And even in a year like this, where we had a, you know, we had a fine economic forecast, we have declining revenue for the uh, biennia out from, from now. But even in this year, legislators are saying they don't have enough money to do things like provide school lunch to all public school students and things like that. So our tax code sets us up to, to not have enough. And over time, the amount of revenue that we're raising relative to the size of our economy is declining. So if you just look, if you normalize the amount that the state spends in its operating budget over the years and you, you know, adjust for inflation and you, um, you know, use the size of our economy, population, personal income to normalize that amount that they're spending in the operating budget. You can see that the line, the line is going down. So even though the absolute number of our budget is increasing when you actually factor in um, uh, 
what we're trying to do. It's it's um, clearly not keeping up and encouraging austerity over time. So a state wealth tax, you know, like I said, is taxing assets that are currently not taxed at all at the federal or state level. We're talking extreme wealth, multimillionaires and billionaires who have more wealth than they can ever spend in their lifetime. It's a modest tax and it would bring in $3.2 billion a year, um, which could go a long way to fund some of these big things that we're being told we don't have enough money to do and also um, help relieve the um, regressivity in our tax code by changing the other side of the tax system at the same time. So. Do you know if the amount would be earmarked? And the reason why I ask us is because we know that housing is front and center this year. So we know that the governor is attempting to pass a $4 billion bond to pay for affordable housing. Would a wealth tax be able to help with something like that? So I think when it comes to housing, we have so much to do. We have such big needs in our state. And so I think with housing, it's a yes and type situation. When it comes to building new housing, that's called a capital project. And that's the area of spending our state can actually take on debt to finance. And so increasing our bond capacity is a, an approach that makes sense in terms of building new housing. But of course, there's so many issues around housing that don't necessarily involve just building new housing. And that's that's the kind of area where we can bring in wealth tax money. Um, we can also supplement any other approach that makes sense to bring more resources for the affordable housing problem. So I think a lot of our um, rhetoric around um, revenue is we're often trying to play whack-a-mole with revenue and saying, OK, we do something over here. We can do something less over here. And I think one of the things I would like to communicate is that um, the status quo in terms of how much revenue we're raising really isn't sufficient to address some of these structural huge problems in our state that we know we need to funnel so many more resources into. So I don't think it would be necessarily, um, you know, uh, replacing an approach such as the governor has suggested. Um, I think it could be in addition to that, um, because especially with housing is such a, it's just such a big issue that requires a lot of, a lot of resources. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it may be a bit of an apples and oranges discussion. But, you know, the reason why I ask is because you mentioned that this is something that has been implemented, has been proposed and implemented and has worked in other countries. Uh, I will also note that uh, California, Connecticut, Illinois, Hawaii, Maryland, Minnesota and also New York have introduced similar bills. Does this is is this bill part of a, a larger movement here in the United States? Absolutely. Um, 2020 actually saw the first wave of wealth taxes being proposed uh, at the state level and at the federal level. Uh, Senators Warren and Sanders introduced wealth tax proposals. Um, Representative Jayapal has also sponsored a wealth tax proposal. Um, other senators and other representatives have introduced um, different ideas around taxing extreme wealth. President Biden has included a wealth tax in some of his proposals. Um, and now we're seeing more state level legislators propose state level wealth taxes. And there's definitely a movement afoot because wealth inequality is at an all time high. And the way that our wealth is being generated and who it's going to is 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 getting more extreme. It already was extreme. It's becoming more extreme. And the super, super wealthy, the top fraction of a percent, the billionaires and multi multimillionaires, they hold most of their wealth in financial assets. That wealth is not being taxed. And so states are missing out on the wealth that's being generated in their state. And so even states that have income taxes, even states that have progressive tax codes are looking at taxing extreme wealth because of the way that our economy is changing and the way that wealth is being held and not being funneled back into state economies. So there's definitely a movement afoot um, it's a movement that's actually very practical at its core, trying to make sure that state budgets can make sense into the future, that we have enough revenue to fund necessary public programs and services. So, um, yeah, California has introduced one. New York has introduced them. And you, you mentioned the other states. So there's definitely a, a cohort of legislators and advocates from all of those states that you mentioned who um, are communicating with each other and supporting each other to make sure that um, it's not just one state doing this, it's multiple states. So it, you know, strength in numbers, right? Absolutely. And it also yeah. helps build the case that state, 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 um, 
state level, you know, um, tax authorities could implement this because we're going to have the support of other states doing similar things. Thank you. That was the point that I was just going to make because, you know, you're talking about some federal legislation and various uh, uh, legislators who are supporting it at the national level. But we know what the situation in D.C. is and we know that something like a wealth tax is unlikely to pass at the federal level. And so it's up to the states to sort of take this kind of thing on. Um, also, you know, it's very striking that uh, as you talk about these, these untaxed giant pools of money, uh, that this is money that is often passed gener- intergenerationally and not taxed. And so this, I think, represents a great opportunity for uh, states municipalities to uh, get a fair share of, of you know, of revenue uh, from this money. You know, I want to, you, you touched on the, the fact a little bit earlier that uh, this is considered a property tax. So we recently heard uh, bill sponsor Noel uh, Frame, Senator Noel Frame, speak to the matter of the bill's constitutionality. And uh, she compares it ultimately to a property tax, which, you know, we know property taxes are constitutional. They pay for things like education. This is no different. We can probably expect a court challenge on this should it pass just like we saw with, with capital gains. Uh, what are your thoughts on the constitutionality of the wealth tax at the state level? Yeah, so I believe when Senator Frame was giving the introduction to the bill for um, when it was heard in the Senate Ways and Means Committee on March 9th, she brought up the fact that every year, regular people who are lucky to own their home and people who rent also, we pay a 1% property tax um, that goes to fund things like uh, schools, firefighters, all this stuff. Um, you pay that 1% property tax on your home, whether you sell the home or not, right? You pay a property tax just on the privilege of having your home. Um, And so a wealth tax on financial assets introduces parity into our tax code by saying those with extreme wealth who grow their wealth mostly in financial assets also pay a yearly wealth tax on the source of their wealth, their corporate stocks and bonds. Um, And so in her introduction, she pointed to um, some work that the Department of Revenue has um, published on the constitutionality of the state wealth tax. And essentially, the Constitution says when it comes to property, you need to tax property uniformly across an entire class of property. You need to tax it uniformly. Um, The maximum rate that you can tax it at is 1%. And then at the same time, the legislature has a separate and equal authority to exempt property from taxation. And so the state wealth tax depends on all of those things by saying we're going to tax extreme wealth held in this class of property, financial assets, at a rate of 1%. And the legislature has the authority to exempt some of that property from taxation. And so that's why the first $250 million is exempt. Um, So... uh, We anticipate that there will be challenges because whenever you do anything these Mm. days, you are challenged by someone out there. Um, And uh, I think it has a very, very strong case to stand up to those challenges. And we recently just had a huge win with the capital gains ruling um, where the Supreme Court ruled that, yes, it is indeed an excise tax. And so I think that's going to inject a lot of confidence into the revenue space that, you know, we can ask the very wealthy to pay their share and stop asking working people to subsidize all the things in our state that we all rely on. Well, you know, I would really welcome the opportunity to have you back to discuss this if and when and ideally when uh, this bill uh, passes. And as I say, it's probably inevitable that we will see some court challenges. So I would say at this point, probably to be continued on that, but certainly yeah. something to be uh, to be tracking. I want to talk a little bit about some of the arguments that we've heard against this bill. Those of us who watched the hearings, uh, the various hearings for this bill have heard uh, the arguments against this. And, and many of the people who watch and listen to this program are, are keenly interested in messaging um, the first argument that we hear inevitably is that this is something, this wealth tax is something that will cause wealthy residents to flee the state, to move out of state. I don't believe the bit that the evidence bears this out, but how do we rebut this? Yeah. So, I mean, I think a simple thing you can say is, uh, you know, the wealthy don't move to optimize their taxes. They move where their businesses are going to be successful and where they have social clout. And uh, folks tend to stay put. So exactly like you said, the research does not bear this out. I do think our culture is fascinated and captivated by the hypermobile billionaire story. And I think stories are really powerful. And so um, I think, um, you know, you got to just point back to the research. And um, I think another, uh, another thing we can ask is, 
you know, when we tax regular people more and more, and by the way, even with capital gains and the working families tax credit, um, the lowest income people in our state are still paying at least four times more uh, of their income in taxes every year than the very wealthy. We don't ask questions about, hey, if we chronically underfund public schools, if we chronically underfund our roads and transit, how's that going to impact uh, regular people's you know, willingness to continue living here? You know, so we, we need to be asking questions about, is our tax system working for us? Is it getting us to the state we want to we want to be and we want to live in? Um, and, you know, are we willing to um, are we willing to ask the very wealthy who are benefiting greatly from the system and really making out very well because their taxes are so low? Um, are we willing to just ask them to pay their share so that we can have the things we all need and rely on? So. I think we need to flip the script a little bit, um, not embrace the um, opposition talking points about um, will the wealthy move? Because we need to be asking if we keep going down this path we're on now with our regressive tax code that's inadequate, that's asking working people to pay the most. You know, is this going to be a state that regular people want to live in and regular people want to move to, you know, and work in. Right. I mean, I, I, yeah. I think that's an important point as well. I mean, people who are wealthy rely on labor. They, they want uh, an environment that is attractive uh, for workers who live in their state. So, yeah, I think yeah. The, yeah. Th those are phenomenal arguments. Also, the wealthy don't move to optimize their taxes. I, th I think that's extraordinarily well put. You know, th as we mentioned earlier, only about 700 people uh, are impacted uh, by this. And there is so much to be gained. And I know that you represent a nonpartisan organization. But I'll just ask you, why do you think this is so tricky politically? Yeah, you know, I think when we are asking the very powerful to um, – pay more of their share. That's just, we're challenging power when we, when we try to pass a new tax. Um, the wealthy hold a lot of power in our country. They hold a lot of power in most countries, right? And passing a wealth tax is shifting the paradigm from saying we're taxing regular people on their consumption and on their homes um, and on their business activity. We're shifting the paradigm and saying, actually, all of this extreme wealth that's there's no light shining on it right now. We're going to shine some light on something and we're going to ask the very wealthy to pay a little bit more of their share. I mean, you're cha you're challenging power and whenever you challenge power, it's a challenge. I mean, that's just that's just a fact. So, I think, you know, you're up against you're up against um, you know, a power system that really benefits and privileges the wealthy. And so I just think that's that's just a fact of the matter. Um, I also think that, um, like I said, in the United States, this is a new idea. And so we got to do a lot of education to make sure people understand that even though it's a new idea, it's a very practical tool to raise significant amounts of revenue in our state. It's implementable. It's constitutional. Um, we have a, a lot of things we can learn from European style wealth taxes. Um, some of which have been more or less successful than each other. So, you know, I think there's a big educational um, moment for us, too, where we have to acknowledge, like, this is a new concept. We got to talk to people about it. Um, we got to make sure that the policy is strong and, the, and that our Department of Revenue um, is ready to hit the ground running and implement this. So. Yeah, I mean, it seems eminently practical. And I think in, in my mind anyway, uh, that seems to be one of the biggest arguments for it. Uh, it is it is very straightforward on its face. As you say, it's constitutional. There are many things to recommend this. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, the bill is considered uh, necessary to implement the budget or NTIB. So it is still alive. Let's talk, as, as we often do in this program, let's talk action steps. First and foremost, in the legislature, what needs to happen next with this bill? Right. So the bill this year, um, there was a Senate version and a House version. The Senate version was sponsored by Senator Noel Frame. The House version was sponsored by Representative Milan Tai, who also was a champion for the Working Families Tax Credit, mm -hmm. um, which is a super powerful program um, that's rolling out this year. Um, and I just think it's really neat that she was the prime sponsor of the Wealth Tax and the Working Families Tax Credit. That's kind of exactly the right um, approach we need for reforming our tax code. Um, we love her here on the show. It's no secret. Yes, yeah. <laughs> she's fantastic. Um, so we had a hearing in the House and we had a hearing in the Senate. 
And the hearings, you know, generated thousands of um, pro sign-ins from people across the state. And I think we might have actually been in, you know, top five numbers of sign-ins for the whole session. Um, you know, over 2,000 people for both hearings. Um, incredible testimony. So feel really proud of the hearings that we had on these bills this session. Um, and so the next steps from a technical standpoint would be to have those committees actually vote on the bill. Um, so it would be House Finance and the Senate Ways and Means Committee. So the next step is technically for those committees to um, bring the wealth tax to executive session and vote on it. And then it would go down the legislative pathway of um, going to the floor and then going to the other house. So in this moment where the budgets have come out and neither but neither the Senate nor the House budget included uh, new tax revenue, um, the capital gains ruling just came out. Um, a lot of advocates are really disappointed in the levels of funding that their areas are seeing. We're in a kind of particular moment where there's an opportunity to say, hey, this is something we can pass this year. Instead of kicking the can down the road and saying, we'll reform our tax code later, let's do something significant now. We've got an opportunity. Um, and so I think that the thing that folks can do if they're excited about this is to contact their legislator or if they want to take it to the next level, they could contact the Finance or um, Ways and Means Committee, and you can send those committees a message. There's a way to do that on the legislative website and say, hey, you heard this really important bill that would bring resources to folks across our state who really need it, um, asking those with the very, very most wealth, some of the wealthiest people in the world to pay a very small amount more Let's do this, you know, vote on this bill in your committee. So that's something folks could do. I also just think um, starting to talk about it in different spaces and and generating more of like a inevitability around it, I think is something we can all contribute to. Um, and you can start now, but it's something we can continue um, during the interim, um, going into next session. So um, those are some actions, but I think the number one thing people can do is contact their legislator and express that they're excited about this and want to see it move this session. Great. Talk to your legislator, uh, contact the Ways and Means Committee, as you say, and really just be talking about this. And uh, Carolyn, I think you've, you've raised so many phenomenal points uh, in our discussion here that people can refer to uh, when they are out talking in favor of this, this very, very vital piece of legislation. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Brotherton, thank you so much for taking the time today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.